I mean, the first barber I went to, it was, it was a white English guy, and I got butchered. <laughs> and I, I, did, I was absolutely butchered, to the point where, on Monday, when I went into primary school, I didn't want to take my cap off, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> when, when they took it off, the laughter was oh, worse. Yeah. Than the That's the worst one, It was it? horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite as a mouse. <laughs> Trust me, your girl's out there, fam. Thus, how long have you been married, mate? Been married for 39 years. Um, still together with my wife. Raised by my grandmother. She gave as much love as she could give, and I have that to be grateful for. Listen, I went on Tinder to chat to Gyal, <laughs> all right? And it just so happened that I chatted to the girl that became my girl. I went to a party in Thornton Heath with um, a mate of mine. I saw her, and it, it was weird. I, I just knew straight away that um, I would marry her. I knew that straight away. I started chatting with her, and, and she gave me a bogus telephone number. I was gutted. I was totally and utterly crestfallen. But um, there was a party at the same house um, three months later. I finessed um, things a lot better than I did the first time around, and um, we arranged to meet again afterwards. And, We've been together ever since. I think for me, the most important part of that, in all honesty, was to be able to transfer that onto our children. We don't realise how much we model what we want out of a relationship based on either our parents' relationships mm. or significant relationships that are in our, you know, in our, in our family or in our, our network. You know? mm. We take a lot of that in subconsciously. Mm. For me, having been raised predominant by my grandmother, traditional, typical Jamaican, everything she did was for the three of us uh, um, to be you know, a woman in her mid-60s, to take on three grandchildren, raising them while your daughter has absolved herself as responsibility. She is and always will be, you know, my role model, my hero. Some people would walk in and then they go straight into the chair. Like, I've been here for an hour and a half. <laughs> my dad used to cut my hair when I was a little boy. But the funny thing is, my, my dad has been bald for so many years. And when he used to cut my hair, he forgot that he needed to comb out the knots. Oh, oh, no! Just going, just going, and I was like... <laughs> Growing up, my parents were very affectionate. You know, my mum was always a very loving person. She loved to get people together. She always wanted to see other people happy. She was always sort of sacrificing her, her own happiness for other people's happiness. A lot of that has rubbed off on me, especially after she passed away. I feel like I've kind of embodied her in, in some way. I sort of took on that role in a way because I wanted to feel like mum was still, that she's present, spiritually or in whatever way. There's something in our society which has definitely been rooted in my upbringing which basically suggests that as men, we should suck it up, you know? Mm. We should just deal with it internally. We don't need to be cathartic. We don't need to talk and communicate. And that, that really stymies us. That I guess also from my perspective, just reflecting it, just holds us back from having the space to actually not only receive love, but also as well show love sure. and care yeah. when people are going through challenges, when people put up the, the flags. Coming out of a, a relationship, I was with her for 16 years in total. And since we split up, I've been exploring, trying or striving to be more vulnerable with my emotions and sharing more because I really do see that that was one of the reasons, the big reasons why I've gone through my divorce. And maybe I put too much of that on her telling me how she felt, but she probably couldn't tell me how she truly felt because I hadn't created a safe environment for her to do just that. I don't know where the need to be stoic is rooted or where it's coming from, but I know that it was passed down from my dad. You know, he's old school. He's, you know, never gonna talk to you about what he's feeling. But I remember one stage he turned around and said, Carl, look, I think I'm depressed. And I squirm at my response to that because when I look back at that, my response was, what do you mean you're depressed? Stop being silly, come on, man up, you know? 
And I see that almost as a cry for help. And yet still my response was one that he instilled in me of being just ridiculously closed. And yeah, I just think that if I was probably a bit more open to recognizing the signs and recognizing what he was going through, then yeah, he could I could have been a bit more supportive to him. I'd been a very angry young man. I was definitely going down the wrong path. And I used to worry because I had so many girlfriends mm. that um, I just didn't think I was ever going to meet someone who I could live with or could, who could tolerate me, mm. you know? But then um, it happened. You know, one or two people have said about, you know, creating space. I created space to allow someone to come in and now be that person that I, I wanted and looked for, you know? So, so much luck in these situations. Moved to London 2000, 2001, I met Hazel and my instinct was told me that there was something about her. So while I didn't know where it was going to end up, you know, I, I followed my instinct. We got married in 2008, had our first son in 2009. Baby number two, Mr. Isaac, was due um, in March 2013. Took her to the hospital. Seven o'clock in the evening, she gave birth to Isaac. But by um, two o'clock the following morning, so just about five hours later, she died. You know, I wasn't supposed to be a single dad with a three-year-old and a newborn baby having to tell Aaron at three that his mum had died and she wasn't coming back. He spoke about what it was about Hazel. Yeah. I saw my grandmother in it. That's it. So I've lost the two women that were the closest to me in the world. But I'm still here. It's interesting, isn't it? Because um, we do have the barber shop, but we don't talk about those types of things. We have the rum shop, but we don't talk about those types of things. You know, we go to we, there's a betting shop, but we don't talk about those types yeah, of things. You know, but we do meet yeah. a lot. You know, as black men. But we don't have those discussions. I don't think I had that, you know. You know how we're kind of fed this definition of masculinity as well? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't that definition of masculinity. Barbershops, I would say, I would say it's a safe space for most, but definitely from my peers that are um, in the LGBTQ plus, it's, it's, it, it can be challenging to, to find a safe space. Even myself, my confidence in barbershops, um, it's only, it was always a case of, okay, go in, get your hair cut, leave. So it's generally a safe space, but what about the people that are on the fringes of it? I think James Baldwin talks about something as a state of abjection, and that's where to feel as a foreigner in your own home. You know, a lot of times we're taught or the definition of black masculinity has been sold to us as some sort of hyper-masculine kind of um, structure or construct. I fully get you on that. When you talk about tribes, it's actually really important. And I'm lucky enough to have like a sick, sick group of mates, right? We've got this group called Feelings, and that's separate to a number of other groups that we're all in. What we all try and do is just support each other. And whatever anybody's going through, we allow each other that space to be vulnerable, to be your authentic self, I feel. We're not all trying to do the male thing and be like, mm, I'm a big man, yeah, I'm nice, don't worry about me. I think that takes great strength to be able to do that and to be able to find it in your heart to be comfortable in doing that, so. Men who, um, who say that, you know, m men shouldn't cry, I don't, in a way I feel sorry for them, you know, because I, I can't, sometimes I think, well, what do you do then when you're feeling like you know, crying. I'm not afraid to cry in front of my friends. I've seen, I've seen the vast majority of my friends cry, especially my closest pals. This is what being masculine is about. I don't care what the friends are doing or not doing, what the friends are saying or not saying. I have to lead by example. 
but not just for my boys, in terms of my responsibility to my community. Too many black boys, too many. Too many black boys going under. No, nah, fam, there's a lot between these ears, you know what I mean? We just need the opportunity to be able to speak about it. And really put ourselves in positions that we can have conversations outside of things that are just physical prowess or race relations topics. There's so much more out there that we all want to talk about. We get pigeonholed into these boxes and I think a lot of black masculinity falls into that at times. For me and my experiences, love really boils down to respect. It is acceptance completely of another person or people, regardless of their flaws and their greatness. I think for me, love is uh, its like commitment. Duty is responsibility that you give because that is what you want. Where I am right now in my life, it's really about the boys and me and them as a family unit and there being love shared between us, us looking out for each other, us having each other's back. That's, that's what it's all about. I hear that.